Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Please take your seats and fasten your seatbelts. Flight crew, please prepare for takeoff. Flight 229, you're clear for departure. Thank you, and enjoy your flight. Hello, everyone. My name is Graham Mann, and this is the Business Aviation Podcast. On this podcast, we interview business aviation professionals with all sorts of backgrounds to learn about experiences, tips, and best practices to be successful. Today's guest is Greg Jarrett, who is the founder and CEO of Stack.Arrow, which develops cloud-based solutions typically powered by the Salesforce platform for aviation and logistics companies. Greg has worked as a charter salesperson all over the world before turning software developer for the business aviation community, and he's passionate about helping business aircraft operators stay at the front of the technology curve. Greg and I are both graduates of the Founder Institute, though he went through the program in Sydney, Australia, while I went through in Montreal, Canada, and we share a passion for bringing technology to business aviation. In this chat, we get into how he originally got into aviation, his pivot to developing software, and his experience starting his own business. Make sure to check out the show notes for details and links from the conversation at leansystems.co slash podcast. Without further ado, enjoy this chat with Greg Jarrett. So thanks for being here today, Greg. Thank you. Great to talk to you again, Greg. So before we get into some about your career and your current business, uh, you told me one of your hobbies is CrossFit. And uh, <laughs> I, I love this quote. You said, quote, I do CrossFit, but I try not to talk about it too much. Which <laughs> I, know, I, I, I realized the naivety of that, of that comment after I submitted, after I clicked submit on the form. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> so, so I've done CrossFit and uh, and still do occasionally. And I have friends who are the fanatics who do talk about it all the time. And yeah. I think, I think some outsiders do view it as somewhat of a mild cult occasionally, but um, I mean, from your perspective, why do they love talking about it so much? Uh, for, for all the people I know, it's, it's, it is a major part of their life. And um, whether it's, uh, you know, they're, for, for me, it's an escape from work. It's, it's that one hour of the day where I'm, I'm not thinking about the business. I'm not thinking about a problem that we're working on or a, a deal that we're working on. So um, uh, for a lot of other people, it, it's, it's an hour of the day where they're not focused on something else in their life. Um, so, yeah, look, I think it, it's made a massive difference to a lot of people's lives, and um, yeah, you know, as long as you as long as you follow the principles correctly, and you get you get good trainers with you, and don't get too many injuries, then um, yeah, it's uh, I've known a lot of people who it has literally changed their lives, to, not just through a weight loss kind of thing, but um, getting healthy and meeting new people, and for me, it's it's also very much social. Um, circle. So I've made some great friends there. And that's, you know, all of that stuff contributes positively to to my life and to, to lots of other people's lives as well. So, um, yeah, I think that that's why people talk about it so much. It, it, it's not like just going to the gym. It does become a, a significant part of your life where you uh, you put other things aside to go and do that. And it becomes more of a hobby and less of a chore to go to the gym. Yeah. Um, I, I think, yeah. uh, I mean, I think that's one of the things CrossFit's done so well is creating those supportive communities. And it's funny. You should mention, I mean, I've known people that have met and then subsequently gotten married from CrossFit and so on, but you yeah. had a, you had a good story where you took advantage of some of those communities. You did a road trip in the U S and went to a bunch of different gyms, right? Yeah, I did. Um, this this was uh, just over three years ago, I think. I was I was just launching our, I should say, our first product, not the not the current application that we that we provide. Uh, but I was I was touring around the states trying to talk to prospects, get leads, um, and and part of that was visiting a bunch of different places. It was, I drove all the way from. Um, Toronto down to St. Louis, Missouri, Kansas City, um, went across to San Francisco and LA and um, uh, just did a, a massive road trip and ended up in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, and uh, yeah, just at, at every 
sort of stop, even if it was just a a stop for the night, not to actually see anyone, but just to get a cheap hotel somewhere. Um, There would typically be a a CrossFit gym somewhere within 10, 10 miles or usually less than that, usually two to three miles. And, um, you know, you could always walk in there, just knock on the door and, and they're, they're always welcoming. They're always happy to see people who, who want to train with them. So, um, again, it, it sort of, it provided me with, with the sense of community and friendship for that six or seven weeks where I, I was so focused on work and, and it, that provided me with an escape to, uh, to have, have that sense of community and friendship. And, um, yeah, for for that reason, it was really important, um, and, and it provided me with a nice break that that made the trip more bearable. Yeah, I think uh, no, that's that's great, and I think that they've done that sort of same community all across the world better than than most other things. I think that's part of where the identity comes from. So, despite the fact yeah. that they talk about it all the time, it's uh, it is a great <laughs> thing for a lot of people. I think. I, th- I think that's it's a great example of a, a business building community around its its members as well. Um, you know, they they have really built one of the best, the most inclusive communities of of any business that I've that I've seen. I think it's everyone is so positively engaged in that in that CrossFit community that uh, um, yeah, it's it's a great example of how to build community and um, and do it on a global scale as well. Yeah, and I mean the marketing. A lot of it is word of mouth too, right? It's uh, people that yep. have you know bring their friends, or they talk to it constantly about their uh, about their experiences <laughs> to their friends and so on, and then they try it out and so on and so forth. So I think you're right. It's uh, yeah, it's about as good as it gets on that front. Yeah, so I want to step back a bit and uh, start back towards the beginning, as people who are listening can probably tell. You grew up in Australia, in Sydney. Yes. Uh, well, I, I grew up all over the place. Um, come, come from an army family, so uh, we moved every two or three years, but spent most of my time in in Sydney. Um, but we've lived sort of all over the east coast of Australia, three years in Toronto, Canada, um, and about a year and a half in London, um, London, England, not London, Canada. Sorry. London, um, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised you know uh, where London, London, Ontario is. But. <laughs> yep. Um, so yeah, it, it, we spent a lot of time all over the world, but most most of my time has been spent in Sydney, and uh, the last six or seven years has been in Sydney. Aside from a year traveling with my with my now wife. Nice. I'm not. I, I don't know why we. I, maybe I just didn't remember, but I didn't know that you'd uh, you'd been in Toronto. I didn't know that Canadian connection. Yeah, yeah, we we spent um my family spent 3 years there. We were I was growing up. I was about between 12 and 15 years old, I think. And uh yeah, we we got the family got posted there through um through my dad's dad's work, the military. So um yeah, absolutely loved Canada. I I did not want to leave when um when it came time to come home and I I pretty much said to my parents, "Oh, you can you can leave. I'll stay here. I'll get an apartment." And I was, I was only fifteen years old, <laughs> and they said, "No, that's that's not going to happen." <laughs> Despite the fact that we don't get quite as much sun as Australia, eh? yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, okay. I had the full Canadian accent when I left. I it, yeah, really? <laughs> wow, I'm good. impressed. <laughs> um, so then, your first job in aviation. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it was ground support at AeroCare. Yeah, that's right. It was um, baggage handling um, and sort of doing doing shift work um, for a company called AeroCare, which is still around. And they they've since grown a lot since since I left. I spent about three or four years there. Um, baggage handling, driving tugs around the airport, um, marshalling planes. Uh, moving freight logistics work for for transport companies, um, yeah, just sort of odd jobs around the airport, and that that got me into um, into the aviation industry. And then through that, I met um, a couple of people who then got me into the aircraft charter industry. And um, and and from there, I moved. From, so from Aerocare, I moved into an aircraft charter company here in Sydney. And, how did, and um, that's 
that's sort of where that side of it started. Yeah. How did you get into the job at AeroCare? And, and you went into that like sort of after high school or I guess whatever the, is it called high school in Australia? Same thing? Yeah. 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 So I was, yeah, I, I took, um, took about a year off after school and went to find a job before going to university. So I wanted to, I wanted to take a year's break in between high school and university. Um, and just found found that job in the local paper and applied for it and was was lucky enough. Um, and yeah, that that year between school and university, I just I just worked my butt off to to make some money and um, and have a bit of a break from from education. Um, had had some great fun doing it and built some really good relationships. And that that year off turned into that same job for, I think it was three or four years before moving into the next role. Um, so that, yeah, that, uh, I just applied for the job basically and and was lucky enough to get it. And, um, I think I joined the company at a time when they were going through a lot of growth. Um, but they were, they were great people in that company. There were some excellent people running it. Um, as a side note, the guy who started that company who has since left, has since started another tech startup called Deputy, deputy Deputy.com, which is, I think, becoming quite popular globally um, as a workforce management solution. Um, So the the learning, the lessons that he learned, his name is Steve Shelley, but the lessons that he learned through um, AeroCare, uh, building that business and managing a workforce of growing from 50 to more than 2,000 people, Wow. Um, he's since built into a a tech solution for workforce management, which is becoming very, very popular on a global scale. So um, that was a, that was a great company to work for, and, and some great people as well. Cool. So uh, that's interesting. I think it's it's much more common in the UK and Australia than it is in North America to take that year in between high school and university. What was the motivation for you to take that year off? Like, what were you thinking? Um, when you made that decision? Um, I think it pretty much came down to I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to study at university. Um, so I figured I talked to a few people and, and got some advice and uh, and the idea of taking a year off was it seemed like a pretty good idea to me because I wasn't sure what direction I wanted to head. Uh, so, yeah, just, just taking that taking that time to decide what I wanted to do. And even now in hindsight, I'd look back and I'd say, take more time, take more than a year, take three years if you need to go travel. Um, that's, that's a lot of, you know, that's the advice I give to my, my nieces and nephews and cousins and that sort of thing. It's don't be in a rush to go to university, go out and, and get some experience working for somebody else and, and then use that to decide where you want to go if, if you do choose to go to, into further education, right. um, which certainly is not a, not a requirement for a lot of the jobs today. Um, so, yeah, just, just get out there, build some relationships and get some experience and see where the world takes you. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And you mentioned you sought out some advice before making that decision. Was it mostly parents and that sort of thing or who were the people you were looking for advice from um that's a long time ago now <laughs> I, I think it it was it was mostly parents uh, parents and family yeah. um yeah look it was it was a long time ago now so I'd, I'd probably have to say um parents and family and i i guess the, the other side of that was my best friend at the time also took a year off and, and he went to work elsewhere but the two of us together um, each took a year off, and then and my other best friend also didn't go to university, so he was working, um, and that made it a really good. Um, the three of us were all hanging out together and um, not worrying too much about um, about what to you know whether or not to go to university and what to do. It was just enjoy that time for what it was and. Um, yeah, make, get some experience and, and meet some people. Right. That makes sense. So you mentioned that the job at AeroCare led into sort of a three or four year position, but somewhere in there, 
before you got into the charter industry or during you <laughs> you did go to school right I did. I did um, a business degree, business slash um, finance degree at the University of Technology in Sydney. Um, and so that was a – I did a lot of that part-time because I was working at the same time as well. I was I was still working um, partially at AeroCare and partially at my next job, uh, which was the charter broker called Ad- Gold Aviation. Mm-hmm. Um and so, yeah, a lot of my degree was done part time. Um, I did a business slash finance degree, and um, I, I can't say that I, you know, the, the classic line. I can't say I have, I have I've used a lot of the knowledge, but I think it's. Um, I think a lot of the the concepts and the lessons that you absorb through that process um, form a form a part of your your future. So. Uh, would I choose the same degree again if I went in? I'm not sure that I would, um, but I'm, I'm sure it, it's, it contributed in a positive way to me getting to where I want to be. Sure. And what at the like before you went into the school? Why why did you choose that field? Uh, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I think I think it still comes down to I wasn't. I wasn't exactly clear on where I wanted to go, um, but I knew I knew it was some sort of business slash industry position. Um, yeah, I, and I, I figured that that broad degree would give me uh, give me the broadest understanding to then choose a direction mm-hmm. where I would go. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I think that 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 degree. I enjoyed I enjoyed the side of being part of a business and and the businesses I was with were were still relatively small to medium enterprises at that time. Um, I really enjoyed that that part of being uh, being part of a small team, a small company where, uh, particularly at the charter broker, there was at the time there was about a dozen people, and there was very much an approach of just get get things done, do them properly. Um, but everyone, everyone can talk to anyone in the business. There isn't a hierarchy. Um, I had some great mentors, um, through that business who were able to show me that you don't have to be a giant company to make a, make a big difference and, and, uh, and make some good decisions. And, and part, the great part of being part of a small business like that is everyone gets stuck into everything. Um, you can't hide anywhere. So if you, if you're going to make an impact on the business, um, you have a, you've got a better chance of doing that with a smaller business, regardless of how old you are. So as a young guy with that small company, it was very easy to make a, a positive difference to the company because everyone listened, um, and everyone, you were able to draw on the ideas of everybody else and come up with the best solution together and then implement it quickly as well. Right. That makes sense. So just to wrap up the university, you mentioned you probably wouldn't choose it if you did it again. Is there one that you (laughs) (laughs) went and I can, I can totally sympathize. I mean, I, uh, I studied engineering and my current work doesn't look to definitely apply to that, but certainly a lot of the stuff I learned, uh, has has shaped me but but i'm curious what would you choose now if you had to do it again um if i if i chose to go back to university again i i would probably do something um i i always regretted not doing a more specific science like um physics or chemistry and um i would probably do something like that just just purely for myself for my own enjoyment right um of of those those topics and and the knowledge of that knowledge of how the world works um i i do have a kind of a logical i guess mathematical approach to things um and i i do enjoy um, the, the physics and the math side of things. And I'm, although I'm not that good at it, I had to enjoy learning about it and understanding those concepts. Um, so I, I'd probably go back and do that for more for a personal benefit than for, um, for an educational reason. Okay. Okay. And yeah. so the mentors you just mentioned in the business, 
I'm I'm really curious about that. So two things you mentioned, you know, in a in a small business like that, you have a bigger chance to make an impact. But I'm sure they don't, you know, small businesses don't just listen to young people because there's less people to, to listen to. I'm sure there's things you did to help that. So what what were some of the things that you did in that business that sort of made you made people listen to your opinions and and earn you that that uh, ability to influence them and then maybe after we'll we'll talk about the mentors a little bit more um i think i think building that credibility with them came down to um performing when the, when the job required it so it was it was a the particular job was as a as a charter broker or a trip manager flight manager um, we did flights 24 hours, seven days a week. Like there, we had we had medical flights where we'd be, we'd be doing a medical evacuation of of someone, um, and that would happen at three o'clock in the morning. And we someone would have to go to the airport and um, let the ambulance in through the gate and park the aircraft and make sure that make sure that the patient got transferred successfully to the ground transport. Um, so picking up the phone for that, for that first phone call that comes in at like one o'clock in the morning and someone says, Hey, I need a, I need a trip to do a patient transfer really, really fast. Um, being the person who that, who the company could rely on to pick up the phone, um, do the deal and do the logistics to make that flight happen, um, it, if, if the company can rely on you to do work like that, um, then then it builds credibility, and they say, okay, this person this person is um, for one thing reliable. We can trust him to do what we need him to do. But then also because you're you're the salesperson doing the deal and, and putting together the pricing for that as well. Um, if you you come up with a an offer to the customer that, um, for one thing, is acceptable, but is also um, profitable for the company to make that money. Um, then that builds credibility with the with the financial side of the company as well. Um, so just you know, a couple of repeat situations like that where, when when the need arose, um, I was able to step up into that role and and build credibility. And, um, I think as a, as a small company, having a number of people that you can rely on to do that was, was really powerful. And, and there were other people in the business who I, who I know that, you know, if I passed that responsibility onto them to say, Hey, we've got this thing happening. Can you, can you deal with it? Um, I could always rely on these people. And there were also some people who maybe couldn't be relied on to the same extent as well. And so, um, and you could see that that credibility of those people was reflected in this, the decision-making process of things that happened beyond that. Um, so yeah, I think, I think for me, it was, it was being reliable when the need, when the need arose. Um, the other side of that was the, the, the owners the, and the mentors, the managers of the company weren't, weren't too demanding. So they were, they knew that if we'd done those kinds of things, they didn't tell us, Hey, you've got to be in the office at nine o'clock the next morning. They're like, Hey, take a day off. Um, you know, you've, you've just made that happen. Um, you've worked, take the day off. So it worked both ways. They were able to give us the flexibility to, um, take the time off when we needed it, but they also expected us to be able to step up in return when, when the situation, when a situation like that presented itself. Right. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, you mentioned small business gave you that opportunity. I think it just becomes much more obvious quickly who can and can't be relied upon. Right. So, you know, it might apply exactly. to a large business as well, but it's going to be that much more obvious and people like yeah. the owners are going to directly notice that. Yeah, and it's, and it's, you, you, people have probably heard this from lots of other people, but it's it's much harder to hide in a small business. Um, there's there's less paperwork and more phone calls, and um, it's much harder to to just disappear into the background. Sure. So you mentioned your 
sort of network that you developed from your first job led to you entering Charter. How did hmm. that come about? What was the process there? Uh, it was it was just people I met through through the ground handling role that I that I did, and one of those one of those people moved on to the next company. And then it was about six months later. He called me up and said, "Hey, there's an opening. Do you want to do you want to come on board?" So um, that uh, that was sort of it, it all just kind of happened. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, but I was able to say yes to those opportunities as well. And I think I think that was that was a big thing um, is being able to say yes when those opportunities come along, even if you even if you're not sure where they will go after that. Um, and to me, that, that was an interesting, interesting opportunity. So I, I was really keen on it. It was probably less money at the time, but um, I figured it, it was probably a better opportunity over the long term. So um, that, that made a difference as well. When you say better opportunity over the long term, what, what do you mean specifically by that? Um, just, just a better opportunity to progress through an industry into different roles. Um, yeah, so I, I think um, the the ground handling role was was limited in that it, it could only go so far, and that you'd you'd always be working airside. Uh, by that being in, by airside, I mean inside the security gate of the airport on the ground. Um, whereas I knew that I, I would want to move into more of a business development slash business management role at some point. Um, and so that, uh, the charter company gave me that opportunity to move, I guess, into more of an office job at the time, but, um, to also take on more responsibility and, um, and, and do something that, that I felt was going to provide better opportunities in the long term. Right. So despite the pay cut you might take immediately, it was fairly obvious to you that there'd be a lot more opportunities to progress career wise in the, in the new position. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's, so you're at Adigold for, for a few years and then that probably brings us to Founder Institute, which course is interesting to me because i also graduated from founder institute not the same yep. program i was in montreal and and you were in sydney but yes <laughs> tell me about what prompted you to apply to founder institute and then and maybe just preface it with what founder institute actually is for those who aren't familiar yeah so um if i could start by I guess the journey to get to Founder Institute, um, I, I decided to start my business in about um, early 2013. And I did a couple of things in that first, I guess you could say first six months of starting the business. And I, and after that, after that six months, I still lacked a lot of direction. I, I wasn't exactly sure where it was going. I, I had this idea for a, a tech product. I didn't know how to build it. Um, I didn't have any money to build it. I didn't know where to go to get investment. Um, I'd attended a lot of startup um, talks and startup community days and meetups and that sort of thing. And I, I think it was it was someone through one of those meetups who suggested I talk to or apply for Founder Institute. Um, and so um, the Founder Institute is an incubator program that um, that is, is available in many cities around the world. They've, they've grown massively over the past few years, but you can go into a, a program in your city and they are essentially an incubator, but they, they will put you through a three-month program where each week – they want to accelerate the growth of your business and give you a, a number of goals to achieve each week and and also deadlines to achieve or milestones to achieve. And so it's about figuring out what what your business is very quickly so that you can then work on growing your business. Um, and by that, they mean testing things out, trying things, building something very quickly, failing, um, talking to customers, trying to make money from customers as well. So in that in that three month program, 
They want you to take money from customers in that in that program, regardless of whether or not you have a product to to deliver. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and typically, you don't have something to deliver. But but the challenge is, hey, get we someone should, to pay you. Should probably preface that by saying, like, there is a plan in place to deliver eventually. <laughs> yes, that's like yes, yes, scam some customers. Yeah. Anyway, no, no, it's <laughs> it's there is there is a certain promise that you make to these customers if you if you take their money and that. But that's 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 the great definition of a business. If you can get people to give you money on the basis of an idea, like your idea is valuable enough that people are ready to pay you money in advance for it, um, then that's a really good indication that you've got a good business idea. Um, so on, and on the flip side of that, if, if people are turning you down and saying, no, go away, I don't want to give you my money, then, um, then maybe you need to reconsider the structure of the business or the problem that you're trying to solve. So, um, yeah, I guess the, the major stages of, of that of that program are identify what you think is the business or what you think those what do you think the the iterations of the business might be. Um, go through go through some pitching practice to develop your idea around that business. Um, and the pitching happens every week. So you've, you've got to pitch every week to different mentors and they will give you feedback so that you can refine your business and your idea. Um, then go out and, and do some surveys and talk to customers and um, get some feedback from customers and then iterate your, your idea a little bit further. And then, deal with some of the legal aspects of setting up a company, setting up a shareholders agreement. If you've got business partners or co-founders, then setting up the agreement between yourself and those people, um, coming up with a pricing model for your business, um, coming up with a business plan and going through the, the lean process of um, uh, defining how your business is going to make money and, and what problem it's going to solve for people. Um, taking you through all of those steps and then also if your business is the type that if you want to scale really quickly and you need some funding to do that, then there's lots of opportunities to meet mentors and potential investors and, and pitch to them and um, one, get feedback from them on your pitch or get turned down um, or potentially get some investment from them as well, or at least at least get a build a network where they might be able to refer you to other people. So there's a, there's a lot in that, and I, I haven't given it in the correct order, but there's basically a three month program where they take you through every stage of of starting a a fast scalable growth business, um, and there's a lot of stages that that you just don't see unless you are exposed to those things and and it 12 week a 12 week program sounds like it's a long time to to build a business but it is it is minuscule it, like you cover so much in that 12 weeks and um if your idea is really worth something at the end of those 12 weeks then then it's worth considering if you're still working at the end of that time then then consider quitting your job and, and focusing on the business because um, if you if you successfully graduate from from the Founder Institute program, then there's there's a good chance you've got a, a pretty good idea and can take it to the next step and and start developing building your product and and charging people money for it. Right. Okay. We'll we'll come back to Founder Institute. I just want to ask you two things. One was what were some specific examples of the meetups you were attending that where you found out about Founder Institute. And to that process, I guess it was six months before you entered Founder Institute. Is that where you were working on the business idea? Yep. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So um, what was the process sort of like, how did the you conceive of the idea and decide you wanted to try and, and build this into a business? Uh, so I, when I left, um, so we go back to the the Adagold charter days. Um, I had I had two periods with that business. Um, one was one was about three years initially. I then went travelling for a year, and wound up in in London, which got me a job with another another charter company, um, which was based in the UK. That company moved me out to Dubai, where I, I lived for three years, 
And I then moved back to Sydney after that three years and, and went back to Adagold Aviation. So when I finished that second period at, at Adagold, um, I, I decided that there was an opportunity for a CRM product of some sort within the business aviation industry. Um, and my experience through dealing with uh, the suppliers and the customers in that industry was that there was there was no there was no central system where where they could all manage their interactions. Um, on the supplier side, they were always very focused on systems that helped drive the aircraft, so flight management systems, booking system, sorry, not booking systems, um, operational systems. And on the customer side, there was there was really no way of um, interacting with the supplier on the internet. It was all done with phone calls and um, and it was very antiquated, that business model. And I felt there was a huge opportunity for a, a CRM product of some sort there. Uh, so that 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 sort of was the definition of the opportunity for me. But the first six months of, of running the business, um, and I'm not a I'm not a developer. I don't come from a, a software background. Um, but in that first six months of the business, running it in 2013, I I was extremely naive, and thought that I could, with about three to six months of training, I'd be able to write the software to build this program myself. Um, and I look back <laughs> now and, uh, and I just, I think, wow, that was ridiculous. Um, so I, I actually went back and I, I applied for an online university course in programming and I did, I did the first semester of that online course and because I, because the need in my head for the, for the system was so strong, I'd actually self-taught myself kind of the next two and three semesters as well. So I'd, I'd finished that first semester, I'd moved on to the next stuff and I was just self-teaching myself programming. And, um, and so it, I, I, I did the first semester of uni and was like, okay, forget this. It's too slow. Right. Um, I'll just, I'll just do it myself. Um, <laughs> and the next, the next stuff, the next step after that was I realized, okay, this thing is going to take years to build. I can't do it. And I, I went to a, I think I ended up at a couple of meetups and one of them was at uh, a tech a tech startup hub in Sydney called Fishburners, which was, um, they're kind of the original um, startup community in Sydney and they have a lot of meetups. There's a lot of people there and I'm pretty sure I just met someone at one of those meetups who said, hey, dude, um, you know, think about Founder Institute. Um, it's It's worth it. Uh, he, this, this guy had gone through the program and was like, look, you sound like it would be ideal for you. Um, and that was a big decision at the time to, cause it costs a little bit of money. You've, you've got a, you've got a, there's a, there's a, uh, an application fee, but then if you decide to go further in the program, it does cost money. Um, not a huge amount in hindsight, but at the time when I, when I was just starting the business, it felt like a lot of money. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was it was a six month process of okay, figuring out that programming and writing the software myself is um, is going to take a lot longer than I than I want it to. Right. Um, so I need to I need to either go out and get some funding or get some investment, um, and or or go out and find some mentors or find a co-founder. Basically, find the right people to. Help me, help me, help me grow this business because it was pretty much all on me at that point. And um, you know, I needed, I needed either technical expertise or or something else to make the business happen. Right. So I think the, the conception of the idea is really interesting. This was sort of a problem. Uh, I don't know if you yourself had lived it, uh, but it was something you yourself had had seen in the industry and. I'm sure your peers felt the pain of, and that was kind of where the idea came from. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had I had lived the problem myself of um, being the middleman between the supplier and the customer, and and just passing paperwork back and forth constantly. And um, I had lived this problem and felt that there was there was not a good way to have all this have all this data coming into a system where you could then build intelligence out of it. Um, 
it was, you know, when I, when I first started, it was still faxes, faxes back and forth to sign a contract. Wow. Um, so, and it's progressed a long way since then. And, <laughs> um, but that's sort of, that was, that was the degree of the experience that I, I had experienced. Um, but I guess, and that comes back to my, my sort of thoughts around get work experience rather than university experience first, because building the, building the work experience in a company and building the, the relationships with people helps you to get a very deep understanding of the problems that exist in that industry. Um, and you can then, you can then take those once, once you know what those problems are, you know, you've got a better idea of how to solve them. And you've also got, hopefully got some initial customers because you can go back to those people and say, Hey, I've solved this problem for you. Um, so having that industry experience was, was really powerful for me. Um, yeah, it gave me, gave me a great network of people and, um, gave me some good stepping stones to then get the right idea for the product, know exactly what the problem was that we were solving, which I thought was right at the time, but it turned out, uh, it turned out that first problem that I initially thought we were solving was not the biggest problem that could be solved. Um, right. uh, but yes, that's, that's the, that's the process of developing business. Yeah. Okay. And, th- and so then during those six months when you were initially studying or, or self learning, were you still working full time or you dedicated yourself full time to the business? I'd, I'd made the decision at that point, or I should say we, my, myself and my then, um, my then girlfriend, now wife, had made the decision together to, for me to focus my time full time on that business. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, she very, um, very humbly went back to work full time and, and funded our, funded our existence essentially. And um, we moved back in with, with her parents, so we didn't have to pay rent. Um, you know, that kept our costs down, but, uh, that was a decision that we made together to, um, she, she believed in my idea enough to say, okay, this is worth pursuing full time. And if you're going to do it, it can't be, it can't be a part-time venture. You can't work on the side and make this happen in the evenings. Um, if you're going to build a proper business out of this, uh, knuckle down and get it done and, and build that business. Right. And your yep. your early estimate of how long it was going to take was that uh, that you relayed to her wasn't quite accurate, was it? <laughs> I think I said something like three to four months. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and this is this is four years, uh, nearly five years later, and it's still going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, not yeah, uncommon. She, I don't think. Yeah, I know. She she very. Patiently said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, sure, okay, all right." And she she had more experience with this. Her family and her brothers have have been through the process of starting and building a business. And she was like, "Yeah, all right, I'll let you think that. I know different." <laughs> whatever, whatever you say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So six months go by. You you did some learning, and uh, you applied to the Founder Institute. So how did the uh, sort of the initial conception of the product changed through Founder Institute, and and what was your Founder Institute experience like? Um, it was tough. Like it, it was it was a fantastic experience, but it it is very tough. So the the pressure of the the milestones that you have to meet each week, um, it is it is almost like working full time on the business. And, and I think the estimate they give is like twenty hours a week or something that that you should spend on the Founder Institute work. And that's that's sort of accurate for the first half of the program. But once you get past a certain point, you figure out that, okay, this needs a lot more of my time committed to it each week. I need to – this is where we start getting into 60, 80-hour weeks kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, just, uh, just going through that program and, and the experience of – of building it up each stage along the way um, showed me that, that I had to commit more and more time to the business. Um, yeah. I think, I think, yeah, just going, going through that program was, 
was very uh, I, was, I was very fortunate to go all the way through it um, and meet meet the right people along the way to to help me get to the end as well right and I mean you mentioned one of the big challenges going in was how am I going to build this thing did you figure that out during the founders too um, we I, I did and it was it was a it was a bit of a decision of how do we get this done as quickly as possible for the least amount of work. Um, and, and that's, that's one of the big lessons that, that you get through founder Institute. It's how do you, how do you build it quickly? It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be right. How do you get it to the first stage quickly for the least amount of money possible? And, um, as we were, as we were building a CRM product, um, it sort of made sense to consider as examples, the other CRM products that were out there. So took a look at all the, all the, all the CRM products, Salesforce, Dynamics, um, Sugar, all those sorts of things. Um, and just as templates for what we were wanting to do and the functionality and features that we wanted to deliver. Um, and then I, I discovered the Salesforce partner program and I was like, this just makes perfect sense. We can, we can use their infrastructure um, and we can also deliver a product that, that is based on top of Salesforce, that, which is what it, cust- a lot of customers want that. They, they want that, that kind of brand or that, that global power behind them. Um, so the, I discovered sale, the Salesforce partner program through that and um, decided to explore building our product on top of their infrastructure. And, and that, that was about a three month process of testing it and making sure it did all the things that we wanted to do. Um, and then, and then just going, Hey, this is the quickest way to get it done. And, and the, I, I had to consider, okay, we use Salesforce. It takes this long. It costs this much. I go out and raise some funding and get, get, get a whole lot of money, employ a bunch of people and develop our own product on the other side was, was option two. And the, the cost of option two versus partnering with Salesforce was exponentially greater and the time to deliver was exponentially greater. So it was going to be like two years and a, a lot of money that we would have had to raise and a team of four or five senior software engineers for a couple of years to build this product or three to four months on Salesforce for nothing. That's just me doing me doing the building on top of Salesforce. So the decision there was, was clear. It was so clear to me. Um, and that the cost of, of what we have to use, the cost of using the Salesforce platform was, was basically going to work out to be a, less or as much as paying a team of software developers to develop the develop develop and maintain our own in-house system so it just the decision at that point was really clear and that that was salesforce is going to be the easiest option for us to deliver the leanest product in the least amount of time for the least amount of cost um, it ticked those three boxes very very clearly um, the only the only thing that that would have pushed it the other way would have been pride in having our own software system, um, and and that that wasn't a business decision that that would have been an emotional decision. So yeah, Founder Institute taught me through that. How do you how do we deliver the quickest possible solution for the least amount of money that gives value to our customers? Um, and that's. For me, that was probably the major lesson and the decision to use Salesforce or their partner program was the was the, the major decision that came out of that. So it was about six weeks after Founder Institute finished, um, signed up to the, the partner program and, um, yeah, started developing on top of the Salesforce system. Cool. And so that brings you to your current product, right? Um, sort of. There's, there's been there's been two iterations of it. The, f- the first one was more focused on a, a very specific subset of customers in the industry. So they're called they're called charter brokers, um, and they manage all the flights that happen between. Well, they, they broker flights between 
um, charter customers and aircraft operators. And they don't, the major difference is they don't own the aircraft or operate the aircraft. So they put the customer together with the supplier and make the deal happen. Our, our first product was very, very focused on those types of customers. Um, and it took it took about 18 months of development and trying to sell this thing um, that we dis- we discovered that whilst we were solving a problem for the for these guys these customers they weren't they weren't prepared to pay the money that we wanted for it to make it a profitable venture um, so most most of the most of the customers we were targeting were five to ten people in their business in one location who needed a software system or wanted a software system to manage all their things, but their expectations of what they should pay for that system were vastly different from what we were, what our minimum price level was. Right. Um, uh, so, and, and I guess in hindsight, we could have answered that question in the beginning mm-hmm. um, if, if I'd thought about it properly, but um, for whatever reason, we, we, we didn't see that problem. I, I didn't see the money problem there. I just, I just saw that we were solving a problem for these guys and they, of course they would pay for it. Um, right. So did you have customers on that initial product or no? Yeah, we, we had some beta customers and we, we had a few paying, but it was pretty clear that we weren't growing quickly enough to, um, justify the ongoing investment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so the you know we we had a few beta customers, uh, but but we we had had so many conversations with other potential customers, and the decision for them, it was that the decisions weren't clear that it wasn't instantaneous that oh bang yeah we need this we need this thing get it, um, and and if the decision for us at that time wasn't that quick then um we had to move on because we weren't we weren't getting customers quickly enough so the, they essentially they weren't converting as quickly as we needed them to to grow the business right. um and so that that was the first iteration of the product um that the lessons we learned through that actually led to the second iteration of the product, which is much more focused on now the the aircraft operator, the, um, the, the, the company that owns and or operates the aircraft. And they are typically a much bigger business because they have they have more people. They've got they've got pilots, they've got maintenance people, they've got operations people, they they've got all these different people to run a very expensive asset. Um, and the, the need for systems for them to manage their business is much more prominent. Um, and, and the first customer, well, yeah, the first customer that we got in the second iteration of the business was actually someone who, who came to us and said, we need you to integrate our flight operations system. So they, they've got a separate system that they enter all of their flight operations data into. Um, and, and all of that, all of that stuff goes into managing the aircraft and operating the aircraft from a legal point of view and an efficiency point of view. Um, but none of that data, none of that data is customer centric. So it won't give them a view of the customer. It, it is all centered around the aircraft. What they needed was that same data presented to them in a customer centric way so that they could build their sales and, and sell more trips. Um, so the solution for us there was take that take that existing data and flip it on its head and make it visible from a customer perspective rather than an operational perspective. And and that that allows those customers to um, reach out to their reach out to their prospects and their customers with better information, more relevant information. Um, simply based on the data that they already have in their existing flight system. Um, so bringing that, bringing that data from, from a third-party system into Salesforce and presenting it in a different way um, really helps them to grow their own business. And I guess that, that's now the problem that we solve is we're helping, we're helping these aircraft operators to grow their own business um, by presenting their data to them in a different way. So what's a 
what's I guess maybe what's the the elevator pitch for the current the current product uh, and like a specific use case, um, including maybe some specific operation software integrations, etc. For for how you'd use Stack. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the the elevator pitch. This is this is a good one because Founder Institute <laughs> teaches you this. I figured you'd have it nailed down. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't. It's it's been quite a while since I've I've given the pitch. <laughs> um, so that that's a tough one, actually. I I would have to work on that. Um, uh, but it, it's essentially so, so, to a customer. The pitch is sell more trips. Right. Um, you use your existing data to reach out to your customers when and where they want to fly, and use that data to sell more trips. Um, that needs a lot of work, that elevator pitch. Um, oh, that's relevant <laughs> to the people you're selling to, for sure. It's, it's relevant to the customer, yeah. Um, what was the second part of that question, sorry? Oh, just a specific like example, use case, um, maybe mentioning like some of the specific integrations you would do. Okay, yeah. So we, we developed um, – <laughs> It's integrating with legacy software is is probably the major thing. So the, our customers typically use a, a legacy system, uh, and this one is called Flight Operation System (FOS). Uh, they put all that data into that into that system, and it runs on a, a very old legacy database. It's all run on premise in house servers, um, and we we are able to extract the data from that system and um, build some intelligence out of it and put it into the cloud. Um, so the other the other big pitch there is that their data is no longer locked into that server. We can we can put it in the cloud and they can they can use it on a mobile app or um, right. uh, you know just 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 that aspect of having it in the cloud gives them a lot more flexibility to have people working in different locations or at different times of day or um, not dealing with the IT hassles of of maintaining a separate customer database somewhere else. Um, right. And what's an example of some of the, the data insights and intelligence that you'd extract? Um, so a, a really good one is, um, is some analytics information on each customer. So, um, they they have no way of knowing the the, the cust- our customer has no way of knowing exactly which of their customers has flown x number of hours, um, which patterns, which cities they're flying to, back and forth all the time. So if we bring that data into Salesforce, we can have an account record. At this point, the call between Greg and I dropped, but we got it back on track quickly. So I think we were talking about um, inf- data extracted using your system and like on how a specific person flies. Yeah, and, and an example of how we how we present that information to the customer. Um, uh, so we we were able to match all the trips that a customer has done with their account record in Salesforce, um, and and build a profile of that customer. So that profile will have X X number of hours that that customer has flown over Y date period. Um, It will have the cities that they frequently fly between. So their patterns of flying. Um, It'll have things like the last date that they requested a quote, the last date that they did a trip. All of, all of that data can be used to trigger things to happen with their sales team. So, um, and, and, the, and triggering these things to, to happen is something they haven't been able to do previously. So as an example, um, triggering business rules like you must, a, a customer must always be touched within 90 days or every 90 days or whatever they set that day rate at. Um, Basically, don't let a customer go too long without hearing from us. Um, the other part is if they have an empty leg that comes into their into their fleet. By empty leg, I mean a, an empty private jet flying between two cities. So if they have that empty leg happening and they know that a certain customer frequently fly, flies between those two cities, 
then we can automatically prompt them to call that customer and say, hey, do you want to use that empty leg? We can give it to you at a discounted rate. Um, and they can trigger things in e-marketing to happen. So sending sending people relevant e-marketing is a really key piece of um, key, key piece of marketing. Um, so if they know that a certain person only flies in the, in California, then there's no sense in sending that person marketing material related to um, East Coast trips. Uh, you know, it, but if you do have something in California, then you need to send it to that person. So, um, sending relevant e-marketing to those people one in, in improves improves the content that they're delivering to those those prospects, um, and also reduces the unsubscri- unsub- unsubscribes that they get because um, people are more likely to unsubscribe from e-marketing that isn't relevant to them. So right. uh, basically only reaching out to the customer when it's relevant to that customer. Um, and and the, the data that we present to the, to the operator in Salesforce gives them a much better opportunity to reach out to those customers when it's relevant to them. Right. And I mean, that sort of data is the bedrock of, you know, any e-commerce business or something else where it's easier to access that data or log online actions so you're kind of bringing that what what yeah. is sort of fundamental data in in some industries to this one yeah i would i would say for most industries they're already leveraging this kind of data and these these kinds of activities um but a business aviation is is quite slow to catch up and um yeah hope, hopefully we're providing that to them um it, it's the kind of stuff that st- big companies just have as standard like it's it's the minimum required kind of data at at big modern companies but um, business aviation is still behind so uh, we're trying to give them that capability right that's fantastic so i want to be respectful of your time so we'll uh We'll do a few quicker questions here towards the end, and then we'll then we'll wrap up. Okay. I, I know you wanted to talk about, um, and and you have already about how supportive your wife has been, but mm. what are some of the things um, a partner or spouse can do to help a partner who's who's starting a company or embarking on a similar adventure? Um, I, I think I think probably. There's there's a lot that the, the partner can do, but um, number one is being is being supportive, um, and and being patient. Um, but I, I think the responsibility there more comes on the founder or the the person starting the business um, to be to involve their partner. So everything that happens every day. Um, you often as a, as a sole founder or a very small business with maybe two co-founders, the only, the only people that you get to share this journey with are other people around you. And that's, that's typically your partner. And if you're lucky enough to have a co-founder, then, then that person as well. Um, for me as a single founder originally in the business, um, my wife was pretty much the only person that I could share things with. And I definitely didn't do enough of that. I could have done more, but, um, yeah, she, she has been very involved in it from day one. Um, at the very least in terms of supporting me through the tough times. And I think that's, that's the critical part is everything, everything's good when it's good. Um, but when, when the things in the business get going really tough and you, you feel like, um, today's the last day of the business, I might as well shut it down. Everything's done. Um, and, and I had a few of those days early on, your partner or your family is the only, they're the only people who are going to support you in those times. Your, your customers don't care. Um, your, your friends might care, but they're not going to understand the extent of the problem. Um, the only person who's truly going to understand it is, is your, your partner or your co-founder or whoever you've shared the business problems with and the challenges. Um, so, so the, the responsibility there is on, is on me, the founder to involve that person and, and, um, share everything with them along that journey. Um, and also, uh, you know, get them involved wherever they can, because that helps them to understand 
what you're going through and thus be more patient um, and more understanding when, when the time times get tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think that's super important. And I've, I've heard it from others as well. Um, but I think, I think there's kind of two, two, two thing two common points that I've heard from others. And, and, and one is uh, they have to know what's going on. It's, yeah, you know, they don't have context for what you're going through, then it, it becomes much more difficult to understand. But the other mm. is, once they do know, they're often the ones that can provide because they don't have their head in the business all day, every day. They're sometimes mm. the one that can provide that clear, objective, third party bit of advice that that you need most. And it sounds like, you know, when when you were initially starting the business, trying to go full time. Uh, mm. your, your wife had that insight and I'm sure she's had many other insights uh, through the years that, that you don't get when you're so true. stuck in the business. Yeah. That is so true. It's, it's that ability to be objective about things and say, Hey, I know things, it seems like the world is collapsing around you right now, but just take a step back and um, the ability for, for the partner to, to do that is really, really important. Um, to just, just give you that different perspective because they're not so involved with the business. Um, yeah, that is, that is really, really important. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, what's a book or books that you've gifted often or, or that have had a large impact on you? Um, uh, actually, it's one that's been given to me recently. Um, which, uh, yeah, th this book is about sales and, and how to how to connect with your customer better, um, but uh, question-based selling. And I, I forget the author's name. I must apologize. But um, no, I'll look it up and we'll add it to the uh, yeah. show notes here. Um, que question-based selling, and it's it's about approaching sales and building relationships with your customer and um, identifying the customer's problem and and being quite happy to walk away from that customer if they don't have a problem uh, so yeah i see for us for us at the stage of the business we're at at the moment it's very much about um building more customers and you know we've got our product very clearly defined uh, we we now need to bring those customers on board and make sure that we connect with them in the right way and and actually solve that problem for them. So each each of our customers has a slightly different problem they're trying to solve. Um, so we we just need to help them through that journey and make sure that we can solve it for them. Perfect. What's uh, how has a failure or an apparent failure later set you up for success or? Do you have a, a favorite failure along the way? Um, <laughs> that's a that's a good question. Probably too many to name. Uh, I'm sure if, if uh, yeah, your experience there's, there's is anything like ours. <laughs> I think I think um, I think a failure. I guess I, we we did an exhibition. I did had a booth at an exhibition about three years ago. Um, where the product was still in its first iteration, um, but that 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 doing that booth wasn't a, wasn't a failure. It wasn't a mistake, but it was the the failures that led us to that to that point, which put us in that situation at that time, which which allowed me to meet the person who would eventually become a much bigger a much bigger part of my business and, and essentially become a co-founder for the business um, so those that series of failures that led up to us being um, in that time and place led to an extremely positive thing happening for the business um, just through meeting the right people at the right time Right. So it it was just it was just fortune it was just luck that that had had us in the right place at the right time essentially. But um, we had to give ourselves the opportunity to be there, and also the also the opportunity to say further down the track we need to we need to kill off this first iteration of the business and focus on the new opportunity, um, which is which is much bigger and much better. Right. So it wasn't successful in the way you thought going in, but. Uh... There was a silver lining. Correct. Yeah, definitely. If you had to give 
a smart, motivated person entering the world of business aviation some advice, what would it be or what advice should they ignore or both? Um, the, the advice would be build, build the relationships with the people. Um, people, in, people in our industry are um, – it's a, it's a great community. This industry, They're, everyone is really really close, and everyone knows everybody. And um, it's you don't want to burn any bridges, but building building strong relationships is is extremely powerful through the network of of this industry. So um, yeah, focus focus on the network and the relationships, and um, and the work will come through that. Awesome. Well, thanks so much yeah. for taking the time, Greg. Uh, really enjoyed it as always. What's the best Cheers, way? Uh, enjoyed it too. What's the best way for listeners to reach you or find out more about Stack? Um, so I, I am on I'm on Twitter. That's probably the only real social channel that I'm on. Greg at Sid, G R E G A T S Y D. Um, and Stack, um, you can find us on our on our website www.stack.stack.aero. A E R O. We've we've got a .aero domain, um, and yeah, that's that's probably the probably the two easiest ways to get in touch with us. Perfect, and we'll we'll link those both in the uh, in the show notes. Thank thanks you so, very much. Thanks so much, Greg. Okay, cheers, Graham. Have a great day. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Just a reminder, you can find show notes, links to everything we talked about and more at leansystems.co slash podcast. And I would encourage you to sign up for our email list to make sure you get notified about new blog posts and podcasts. See you next time.